Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath. And as we take this time to learn more of you and your ways and how you have led in the past, we ask that you give us understanding of these things because uh, if we're going to follow you in the future, we need to understand how you've led in the past. And uh, Father, we ask today as we look into your word and things that have been written about you and your ways, we ask that you give us wisdom and understanding. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. So what we've been looking at here is the concept of how God led the prophets. Um, the, uh, the prophets and the leaders of the church. So just because someone's a leader of the church doesn't necessarily mean he's a prophet. Uh, prophets can be leaders, but leaders ne not necessarily are going to be prophets. So there's, there's uh, these concepts that we need to understand as we move forward in time. Uh, we are told that there will be leaders and there will be prophets and teachers and so on that have these spiritual gifts that we need to understand what they're going to be like, the traits that they will portray, the fruits that they will demonstrate. And we need to mix that with the Old Testament prophecies and the New Testament prophets, uh, prophets and, prof and leaders. We need to see how they were back then so that we have an idea of how to test those that are in the future and have gone before us. Because if we're going to be following the ideas of prophets in the future, which were shown, we've already read that, Acts chapter 2, that in the last days, uh, young men would have dreams and old men and maidens and so on, both male and female, and I, I'm going to assume that we know what a male and a female is, um, that we're going to have those people that are going to be teachers and prophets, and we're going to have to test them. And there is a concept out there uh, inside churches and outside churches that a prophet is perfect, never makes a mistake. The leaders never make a mistake. In fact, the leader... I've heard it said they're the voice of God. Well, it's not always been that way, and we need to understand that. So the prophets and leaders were not God. They weren't omniscient. In, the, in other words, they weren't all-knowing, and that's extremely important uh, for us to understand. So how do we settle differences idea, of ideas when amongst the leadership or those that are trying to lead people, when they have a difference of an idea and it's based on what they deem to be biblical teachings, how do we deal with that? Do we just ostracize them? Or do we sit down and reason amongst ourselves? Uh, and the other idea there is, what do we reason with? And uh, we're going to look at that briefly again today because it's very, very important that we settle our differences, if they're biblical differences, of course, uh, based on certain things. Number one uh, would be God's word. That would be how they do it. That's how they've done it in the past. That's how we need to do it in the future. How do we treat each other when differences arise? And this is where the fruit is going to come out. You will know them not by their words, but by their fruit. Uh, people talk about a lot of things and a lot of grandiose ideas of what they think. But there's going to be differences arising amongst us. And we need to know how we're going to treat each other. There again, do we just ostracize them? They don't believe what I believe, so I can't talk to them anymore. In fact, I'll go one step further and tell everyone that they're apostates and false prophets and so on without first sitting down and reasoning together. People don't understand that our words and our actions are going to be taken to court one day and uh, we're going to have to give an answer for all the things that we've done in the flesh. I've read that somewhere. And I happen to believe it. So we've got to be very careful 
how we treat each other, especially when a difference over God's word uh, comes about. I've got a hunch that it's our characters that are the most important thing uh, that God is looking at. He wants to change our characters into his likeness. And he's going to use the word to do that. And uh, we're going to have to display the fruits of somebody that God is in control of. And sometimes the truth is not the most important thing, but how we deal with each other. So we need to understand that. And that will help us as we move forward in truth. Unless we learn the lessons of the past, we are, and you can finish that, um, we're going to do that. Why are we going to do that? If we're not led exactly by the Spirit of God in how we deal with these things that we're talking about, we will repeat what those who have gone before us, we will repeat what they did. Why is that? Those that have gone before us, in some cases, did things according to their own ideas. And so, what are their own ideas? If they're not led by God, human nature is the same yesterday, today, and in the future. They will do the same thing. Us human beings will repeat the same things over and over and over again if we're not led by the Spirit of God, which when we're led by the Spirit of God, we're going to change our direction. If we're not led by the Spirit of God in all the decisions, how we settle differences, how we treat each other, um, when differences arise, we will do exactly the same thing that goes, those who have gone before us. Now, so what we're going to be doing here, we're going to recap some of the stuff that I want to bring forward into the presentation today to see how they operated in the past because that's going to help us a lot as we move forward. And there's some lessons I believe that I've learned that I just want to share them. And I believe that if we all learn these lessons, there would be a lot more unity in the diversity of God's people. That's extremely important. We can disagree and still have unity if we will do what we should do and uh, learn the lessons of those who have gone before us. So I want the first one where we looked briefly at um, Acts chapter 15. We want to kind of look at this again. There was a difference of opinion here. Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. This is Paul. Here, Paul and Barnabas are teaching. They're going around city to city in the, in the Gentile regions of the then known world. And they're teaching certain things. The rumor came down and they were at Antioch at, at this point. And people came from Judea and they were teaching the brethren, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses. Really wasn't the custom of Moses, it was the custom of God. In fact, uh, Paul elaborates on this in, in Romans chapter 4. Very interesting. Paul calls it the sign of the seal. And, and that's interesting in itself. Unless you are uh, circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So what they were teaching the Gentiles is if they want to become converted and so on, they would have to be circumcised according to the custom of Moses. That was their entry level, if you will. And this didn't sit too well with the Gentiles. It was kind of foreign to their ideas. And uh, Paul was teaching something other than this. Uh, and it's important for us to understand exactly what Paul was teaching because that's going to help us to understand how we can lead Gentiles as well or those that do not understand things the way we understand things according to the Torah. So we go on here in verse 2. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So these are people, let's get the story here, let's get the context. These are people that came from Judea. Where is Judea? That's where Jerusalem is. That's where the headquarter of the new Christian church was. 
Those were believers in Yeshua that also kept the Torah. And they were teaching people everywhere they went that they had to keep the Torah and uh, get circumcised and all of these things. But Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute. You know, we read those words and we don't really think about them. This is Paul here that had this miraculous conversion experience. He takes Barnabas with him, son of encouragement. That's a good guy to take with you. And they're teaching everywhere. Certain things, the rumors out, they've been teaching things that are not true according to the what? According to the GC, if you will, the general conference back in Jerusalem. So they had no small dissension with them. This is a dispute that arose of a teaching that there was two camps, those of the apostles and elders in Jerusalem and those of the new convert, Paul and Barnabas, and they were going to have to come together to hear, hear what, was, what the apostles. Now, those that came from Judea, we can assume they were teaching what the general conference was teaching and they wanted to take Paul and Barnabas. Why? So that Paul and Barnabas could tell them that they were all wrong? No, it was so that Paul and Barnabas could get back on track. Um, that's really what's going on here. But some of the sect of the Pharisees, now once they reached Jerusalem, of the Pharisees who believed, who believed in Yeshua, rose up saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. These are things that they had been believing for many, many years, thousand years plus, that they had to do this. And it was very hard for them, don't miss this point, they were, it was very hard for them to change gears to a new idea or a new concept. Now, I propose that this new concept that Paul and Barnabas were sharing was from Yeshua himself. Paul spent some one-on-one -on -time, uh, one -on -one time with Paul. Yeshua did. And so Paul had this new understanding, and that's what he was teaching. So he came and was sharing this new understanding with the apostles and leaders of the church. Now, the apostles and elders came together to consider the matter. And when there had been much dispute, here again, much dispute, there was differences in what they were doing. Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the, word of the gospel and believe. So this is when Peter had his experience with Cornelius, the Gentile. And he had this vision of the sheet coming down. We went through this uh, last week. And Peter uh, concluded through that vision that God wasn't showing him all the things he could eat now. He was showing him that the Gentiles, um, the Gentiles now should not be considered unclean. They should never have been considered unclean. These are traditional concepts that came in because some of the laws. They wanted to make God's law a little bit better and thorough, so they made their own little regulations, and it came to the place where Gentiles uh, were not allowed to mix with Jews, and they had these misconceptions uh, of what the Torah was actually trying to teach. So Peter reminds them of this, so he's actually siding in, in this case, after there was much dispute, much going back and forth. That's kind of the point we don't want to miss. There was dialogue, some of it heated. Don't be surprised. And uh, they, Peter rose up at the end and says, hey, this, what Paul is talking about here is in keeping with what I had this vision and Cornelius, when I went and I shared the, with Cornelius the gospel, and his whole family was baptized. So this is, this is what uh, I, I conclude that Paul, what Paul is saying here is very important. Now, it says, after that, after they had become silent, James answered, saying, men and brethren, listen to me. So now it's James's turn to speak. 
Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. So he's siding with Peter here, but this is the point we can't miss. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. This is how the argument or dispute was settled in Acts 15, is that Peter and Paul are both in harmony with the prophets of the Old Testament. I'm suggesting here that unless we use the prophets of the Old Testament to settle our arguments, we will not have the same result that the apostles and prophets had at their general conference here in Acts chapter 15. We've got to use the prophets. It's not good enough to use a teacher of God's word. That's anyone in the world today that may be teaching about God's word. Some of them even deem themselves to be prophets. And, um, and so we can't use them as the final word or the final, the bottom line. We've got to go back and take what they're saying back to the prophets. And if the prophets agree, then we can move forward with it. This cannot be overstated today as we move forward, where there are many, many voices out there claiming that they have the truth on certain matters. We need to do this. In fact, in John, I think it's 1 John, uh, he John tells us that many antichrists have gone into the world and many false prophets. And, and so we've got to really look at that today because there are, I believe, many more false prophets and those claiming to be teachers of God's word. How do we settle things? We go back to his word and measure it. Now, some of these stories that are around today have been so well put together um, They've connected dots, but some of the dots that are connected don't really hold up under close scrutiny. And it's not that these people were out to deceive people. They came to conclusions based on the desire to come to a proper conclusion. And sometimes some of the things they put together just plain don't work. That's why we've got to sit down and go through these, some of these teachings carefully and see what actually works and is in accordance to God's word. <clears throat> and someone will say, well, that's going to take a long time. I just want the Reader's Digest version. Well, you know what? The Reader's Digest version is not going to cut it because it doesn't demonstrate all the proofs that we get to to have a conclusion. Now, I'm going to go way out on a limb here. I don't like to do this that often. But those that I believe are going to be amongst those people in the time of the end and are preparing themselves to be of the 144,000, they've got to do what Peter said was to diligently search the scriptures. Now, diligently searching the scriptures is not just a 15-minute study, maybe once or twice a week or maybe even every day. That's not diligently studying the scriptures. That's painstakingly uh, time out of your busy schedule to devote to, to God's word so that we know what the Lord has said and what he hasn't said. Now, I believe also that in the beginning is what will be in the end. The beginning, if you remember, was of all about the Garden of Eden. And Satan said, who speaks through many Bible teachers today, are you sure that's what God said? How are you going to be sure with what God said unless you know what God said? And if you know what God said, you're going to have to spend time in his word. Now, just by knowing what God said, it's not going to save anyone. 
But if we want to be those numbered among those that are not deceived by what God said or didn't say, then we're going to have to know personally what God said. We're going to have to own personally what God said. And the only way we're going to own it is if we've done the excavation in God's word ourselves. We cannot let others do that homework for us. Uh, that has worked in the past to a degree, but is not going to work in the future because we're going to be put under the spotlight for what we believe. And if we cannot give an answer for what we believe from God's word, we will be laughed at and uh, it's not going to go well for those. This is why we're putting these studies together so that people understand these things. Now, this is not for everyone because not everyone is going to be willing to put the effort into this as I have done, as you have done. And they're just going to be sheep. And I'm not sure where that's going to lead, but it may lead to a slaughter. And I'm trying to hear how people understand that while they may be sheep, they don't need to go to the slaughter. Uh, I believe Solomon said something like this. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, Only a fool dies before his time. And I believe that we need to be able to stand on God's word and God's word alone, not by what some teacher said or whatever. We always need to take it back to God's word and believe it because God's word said it. I was looking at some things which we're going to get to, not today, but we are going to get to the time periods of Daniel and Revelation the 1260-day time period, the 1290-day time period, 1335-day time period. And those time periods, uh, the 1260 is repeated five times in the book of Revelation. That tells me it's very important. And also the 2300 uh, time period, and we've been looking at the 490-year time period as well and we're going to really pull all that stuff together not now but the reason why i bring that up now is because there are accepted teachings out there within the church that i have been uh brought into a knowledge of the sabbath and and many other things clean and unclean meats and these things uh, what happens to a person when he dies and and these type of things I have been brought into the, to an understanding of those truths through the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But after I kept studying, I saw things that weren't consistent with when I went to God's Word. Things just didn't work. And I believe, personally, that these things have to come to light because Yeshua said he would lead us and guide us into all truth. If we want to know what all truth is, We're going to have to continue our study of what? His word. And that's my point. We need to go back to his word and and find out what things are true. And I just want to give one example here because those uh, from other churches, from the Messianic circles, from the Seventh-day Adventist church, most churches believe, and we're going to get into this full on here in a bit, Most churches believe that when the Passover and first fruits came and and Pentecost came, those types, what they pointed forward to, were fulfilled at the first coming of Yeshua. We're going to look at that closer as we go here today. That those feasts were were all done away with uh, because... Yeshua fulfilled them. But according to Yeshua's own word, he said in Luke chapter 22, verse 15 through 17, write that down if you want. He said himself, I have desired to eat that Passover, this Passover with you before I suffer. I will no longer eat of it, the Passover, that's what the it is referring to, until it is fulfilled. 
fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Have I arrived at the kingdom of God? No, I haven't. Spiritually, have I? Well, some would argue yes. Um, but in the reality of the situation, Yeshua was not just talking spiritually. He was talking physical, the physical kingdom of God. And he told us that the Passover is not fulfilled until the kingdom of God comes. Okay, so the reason why I bring that up is it's been a long-held tradition in the Seventh-day Adventist church that the feasts no longer are to be kept because Yeshua fulfilled all of them at the cross. Well, all of them would include the fall festivals as well. That would be the Feast of Trumpets, that would be the Day of Atonement, and that would also be the Feast of Tabernacles. But clearly, we've got teachings that clearly demonstrate that these festivals were not fulfilled. None of them were fulfilled. They have been applied. They have reached partial fulfillment at the first coming of Yeshua, but definitely not all. So these are traditional church teachings, traditional teachings in the Messianic world that the spring feasts have all been uh, fulfilled. Therefore, we don't really need to celebrate them uh, wholeheartedly. In other words, we don't need to keep the seven days of the Feast of Passover. We only keep those that keep them, really only get serious about the Feast of Tabernacles, and that's where we all get drunk. I said that in jest, as a rebuke. Um, these festivals are for learning about God's word. They're very serious matters. They're not party on um, times. Uh, God does not bless that kind of a gathering. So here we have an example of a traditional view that's held in many uh, fellowships that the festivals are gone and done away with. Well, that's only one thing that we've looked at. We're going to be seriously considering the prophetic uh, teachings of many churches, including the one that I came from, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we're going to see that they have other things in their teachings that we need to move forward on, and that is the understanding of these time periods, this 1260, 1290, 1335, and including the 2300, uh, evening and morning, all these prophecies are, have not been fulfilled in the past, just as the uh, festivals have not been fulfilled, but they have a future fulfillment where every specification in the prophecy is fulfilled. <clears throat> and I would suggest the reason why the church that I was a part of and used to teach in, Seventh-day Adventist Church, the reason why they don't see this primarily is because they don't put the prophecies and the festivals together to see that they have an end time or a fulfillment that is yet in the future. If we would just do that one thing and be willing to discuss what the possible fulfillments are, I believe, personally, that it would settle all of our differences and we could be in union with one another <clears throat> and move forward in our understanding and show those that are outside of our spheres that we have unity amongst us in what we're teaching. I believe this is the cornerstone uh, that we need to build on is number one, go to the Bible and the Bible only for what we're going to teach and blend the sanctuary service, the times that are appointed in there with the prophecies and that will, I believe, bring us into unity. Of course, we have to have the spirit of uh, discernment in all of this and the spirit that wants to have unity. And sometimes unity means sitting down with your brother or sister and working out your challenges other than just ignoring it and just pointing the finger at those that will not believe what you believe to be true. 
So this is, uh, this is what we're building on here. So the general conference. After this, I will return. This is how the matter was settled by James. After this, I will return, quoting from an Old Testament prophet here. I believe it was uh, Amos. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. So the words of Paul, the words of Peter, were tested by the Old Testament prophets. I believe that if, the old, if they could not find evidence in the Old Testament prophets that Peter and, and Paul were promoting, they would not have accepted it, but the dispute was settled by what they found in the Tanakh, the Old Testament. And that's exactly the lesson that we need to learn today is how to settle our differences because our differences will come. Will they be heated differences? They very well could have because what we have accepted as truth up until now, may very well be challenged by someone, and we've got to be ready to sit down and work out these challenges by the method prescribed in God's Word. And that is from Amos chapter 9, 7, and 12. I will, rem I will remind you, if you don't know where uh, Amos fits in the line of the prophets, but this was before... I believe, if you check it out, this is before the temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. So now this prophecy that the temple will be all fallen down is really showing the destiny uh, of Israel uh, back way back then and that it would be rebuilt. It had been rebuilt. The Gentiles were now coming. Yeshua had come as prophesied in Daniel chapter 9. And these things were coming to fruition. And they quoted this scripture that uh, Amos was talking about. It seemed good to us. After this dispute was settled, proof of the prophecies, uh, being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you with our beloved uh, Barnabas and Paul. Notice here, the whole thing changes now. We are in one accord. Why are we in one accord? Because we sat down. They probably weren't sitting down, but anyways. They sat down with one another. They discussed the matter, heated dispute, and the Old Testament scriptures settled the matter for all of them, and it brought them into one accord. This is what we need to do uh, with, our, with our beloved uh, Barnabas and Paul, men, men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. We therefore send Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by the word. So now Judas and Silas, being prophets, also exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. I bring this in because it, it demonstrates something that, number one, Paul and Barnabas weren't the only ones teaching this. After they all met together, they all went out and were teaching the same thing. This is how it works. So we go through to this, the dispute, we settle it with God's word, we all get on the same page, and now we can go out with confidence that we're actually teaching what is right. The other concept here is Judas and Silas were considered what? What does God's word say? Prophets. They were prophets. So they had prophets back then, and we're going to have prophets in the future, so we need to understand what constitutes a prophet, because that term is used uh, in today's world. I believe it's used a little bit liberally. They exhorted the brethren and strengthened the brethren with many words. So they were teachers, uh, 
and exhorted the brethren and encouraged them. And that's part of the work of a prophet, obviously, because that's what it's telling us here. But Paul insisted, so they go on. They're all of one accord here. And they were going to go out again after this. And Paul insisted that they should not take with them that one, the one Mark, who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had gone with them to the work. Had not gone with them to the work. So this is a fellow named Mark. It looks like this is Barnabas's cousin. And Barnabas was leading him along in the work. Uh, and what happened was, I guess, Mark departed, probably caused a little bit of grief and challenges with what Paul and Barnabas were doing when they were ministering in, uh, in these Gentile cities. And Paul said, no, we're not taking him. Uh, we went through enough hardship with him before. We're not taking them. Then a, the contention became so sharp that they parted one from another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. <clears throat> Here again, I bring this up to demonstrate that the apostles and prophets in the past didn't always agree with each other. And uh, they, there was a sharp contention here, and Barnabas actually went his own way, and so did Paul. And we need to understand this. This happens. Don't be shocked. But if we can learn anything from this, later on, Paul said Mark was a great help to him. So Paul actually came around on this issue, or, or Mark came around on his issues, and they ended up working together, and Mark was a great benefit to him later on. Why do I bring this up? <clears throat> I bring this up because sometimes the disputes we have with other people may come around, we may, for whatever reason, either side may come around and start working with that person again. So that tells me something. We need to be very careful of what we say to about each other to others because if we, be, if we actually start spreading things about certain teachers, we may get to the point where our hearts will be hardened and we will not go, be able to go back on the things that we've said in the past, <clears throat> especially when we start teaching people about others that are contrary to what the actual truth is. So Barnabas took Mark and they sailed to Cyprus. So Barnabas now is, has taken Mark, sailed to Cyprus. They're going to be teaching what they believe to be true. And Paul's going to be teaching what he believes to be true. I think at this point, Paul and Barnabas were teaching the same things. The dispute was over Mark. So it wasn't even over God's word. It was about a personality conflict that was going on there. And they separated one from another. Paul ended up taking Silas, who was what it said to be a prophet. So now we have two prophets and teachers that are going, and that would have been a powerful combination I would think as well. Now, so what happens later after all of this discussion in Acts 15? And it seems like in Jerusalem they settled the matter forever. We're not going to have to worry about this Gentile thing, this, this Hebrew thing where we've got to do this, we've got to do that in order to be saved. Um, but we're not going to worry about this difference between Christians and Hebrews or Jews because everyone is saved one way only and that's through the sacrifice that God has provided in the person of Yeshua. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of not only the Gentiles but also the Jews and without that sacrifice for the Jews they I would say cannot be saved. And in times past, God has winked at the ignorance of both the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, but now, in this time of enlightenment of how we are saved through the sacrifice of Yeshua, it is not the blood of bulls and goats that saves us. 
And I would like to think that everyone knows that, but apparently everyone does not know that. And that is one of the things that there are disputes even among believers in Yeshua, the same way it was before. And we're going to see that here manifested in the, uh, in the both the New and the Old Testament. And it's going to give us light on how we're to deal with problems that are raging amongst believers even today and how we can settle the matter. Now we have Peter and Paul in conflict in Galatians. Uh, and it tells us there, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, now that's the leader in the Jerusalem church, who we had just seen settled the matter. It says that he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, when these certain men came from James, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. It's very evident to hear in this text that James didn't actually learn the lesson fully. He learned it partially, but not fully. And there was still some confusion over this issue between Gentiles and Jews. And Peter now is playing the hypocrite, we, t we are told here. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, with Peter. So even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Now Barnabas was the one that was with Paul, apparently teaching the Gentiles that they didn't have to be circumcised. And I use that word apparently teaching the Gentiles that they did not need to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. Now even Barnabas has flipped in his separation from Paul he has flipped his idea, and now he's become a bit of a hypocrite. Being a hypocrite is teaching one thing and doing another. We're not given the details on what they were doing, but they were teaching the Gentiles one thing, and yet in their lives they were doing another thing. And this is not what we want to be doing. goes on to say in uh, Galatians 2, Verse 14, but when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? So Peter was doing one thing with the Gentiles. When he was with the Jews, he was doing another thing or portraying something that was not straightforward in the gospel. And it goes back to the Acts 15 concept when apparently they had settled the matter. Well, time went on and they went back to the old habits, I believe, because they weren't moving forward in what the truth really was. Now, in Acts chapter 20, we're told, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Here's where the controversy rises. Why was Paul doing this? Was this because of old habits? Or was this because now the gospel, which included the keeping of the festivals, had gone to all the world? This is why Paul sails away after the days of unleavened bread, because he was keeping the days of unleavened bread, not in Jerusalem, where it was mandated in the Torah, but in Philippi, so we know there's some kind of change in the way Paul is thinking here. I was told in the church that it's because old habits die hardly, and uh, this is why he was still keeping it, but he was keeping it outside the parameters of where he was commanded to be keeping. I propose it's because the, the Passover, with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the full eight days, are part and parcel of the gospel and the teaching of the gospel. That's why Paul was now keeping in, in Philippi where it would have been uh, Gentile believers primarily, so they are part of the gospel. But people would argue with that, and they would say, no, no, it's just because he was doing this. 
And this is what the Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches. This is what many other church teaches because it's not clear exactly what's going on here. So if you want to believe that Paul was just doing it out of habit, well, that camp's over here, and therefore I don't need to do it because Paul was a Jew. But the other camp says, no, no, he's doing this because we should be keeping it um, because it did not, don't miss this point, because it did not reach its fulfillment at the time of Yeshua. Therefore, we should still be keeping it not only to remember what happened in the past, but what's going to happen in the future. Therefore, if the Passover is something that's going to happen in the future, in a fully, fuller sense, as what we saw with Yeshua in his own words, then it would behoove us to study it out to see what is uh, going to happen in the future regarding the Passover. This is the position that I have taken, that the festivals have not been done away with because they have not been fulfilled. They still have things that we can learn, uh, many things that we can learn, of events that are still coming. Now, I'm going to go now to someone that has been declared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, no secret, anyone can look this up, uh, by someone that ha they declare is a prophet. And I'm not going to speak to the validity of that, but it's going to come out uh, how I view this um, also. This is what Ellen White has said of uh, that verse, a commentary on that verse. At Philippi, Paul tarried or delayed to keep the Passover. No question about what he was doing here. He's not just waiting until it's over. No, he's keeping the Passover. That's why he tarried. Only Luke remained with him, the other members of the company passing on to Troas to await him there. The Philippians were the most loving and true-hearted of the apostles' converts. During the eight days of the feast, he enjoyed peaceful and happy communion with them. Now, I don't deem this as the word of God, because it's not. But what this does for me it helps me to understand what the word of God, the rock, is actually saying. And so this helps me. So this, um, these words taken from Act, the book called Acts of the Apostles actually help me to understand, and this is the position that I have, and I think it's kind of cool that she confirms what I have seen in the Bible. I like that. So we're going to carry on here, and, and what I'm suggesting here is Paul was not teaching that the law of Moses was done away with. He couldn't possibly be teaching this, but this is what he was accused of so many times by not only the Jews and the Sanhedrin, but the believers in Yeshua were accusing him of the same thing. But by his works, he's teaching otherwise. He's teaching them to keep these things. Now they left there, it says, for Paul decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Very interesting again. Well, I've heard it said uh, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that uh, he's trying to get into Pentecost because there's going to be a lot of people there and uh, he's going to want to try and reach a lot of the Jews from all over the world because they were commanded to be there. And that's the sole purpose of his visit to Jerusalem at that time. I propose, as we have just seen, that Paul continued to keep the feast well after 20 years. That's Acts chapter 15 or verse 20, chapter 20. This is approximately 20 years, uh, best estimates are, after... Uh, Yeshua died on the cross, apparently did away with all the festivals. Paul is still keeping them. Even his one-on-one -on -one time with Yeshua did not uh, eradicate these concepts. Why? I believe because they were not done away with. Paul continued to keep them, not only himself, but he kept them in Gentile territory of the newly converts to, to this newfound faith that Paul embraced 
and he was sharing it with the Gentiles, keeping those things that were contained in the law of Moses, which is a misnomer because it was the law of God, not the law of Moses. So for those that want to do away with parts of the law of God that the disciples were continuing to keep, who are they listening to? Are they listening to God's word? Or are they listening to man's word? I'll let you make that decision. But I would like to stand on God's word because it's God's word is how we're going to be judged in our final judgment. So he goes on. He's going to Pentecost, yes, because there would be a lot of Jews there, mostly Jews, some Gentiles, as we saw. The Ethiopian eunuch went there to celebrate. He wanted to celebrate the feast. And so there would be Gentiles there as well. And we see this through the New Testament. There were Greeks came to celebrate the feast that met Yeshua on that last week of his ministry. So we see there's Gentiles there as well. And uh, the point that we don't want to miss is there would be believers in Yeshua from all the lands as well. Because in Acts chapter 2, a long while ago, Acts chapter 2, they heard Peter preaching and they were from all the different countries of the then known world. They would have gone back, shared Yeshua. They would also come to Jerusalem as well. And so the New Testament church actually had its headquarters in Jerusalem. And I would suggest this is another, probably one of the main reasons Paul wanted to go there because the Gentile uh, believers would come to Jerusalem and also the Jewish believers would all be there too. And he would be able to meet from believers from all over the then known world all at one time which would be a, a, a great manifestation of God's moving among those th of the believers. And this is something that I'm sure all of you would like to go to as well. Can you imagine a, um, a general conference of all the people that actually believed the truth, not the perceived truth, but the truth? I'll be there. Get me my plane ticket. So now he goes on to say, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. Why did he do that? Because he didn't want to go to Ephesus, tells us here. Um, and when they had come to him, they said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord in all humility with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. And I, I would add here the plotting of both the unbelieving Jews in Yeshua and both the plotting of the believing Jews. Uh, they were on his trail to trip him up as well as we've already seen. Verse uh, 19 of chapter 20 and verse 20 of chapter 20. And Paul continues, he says, How I kept back nothing that was helpful. Well, Paul says he kept up nothing that was helpful. Do you suppose that what was helpful for the Gentile believers back in, in uh, verse 6 of the same chapter was the keeping of the Feast of Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread? I would suggest very strongly that keeping that feast is very helpful. It not only takes you back to the time of Yeshua as our Passover, but it also moves us forward in our walk that tells us that we need to now eat unleavened bread, which is sanctifying our lives, setting our lives apart to be apart from sin when we start to live as Yeshua lived in his resurrection. We need to take part in his resurrection as our resurrection and live this new life. And there's no better feast of all the feasts that teach us how to live after we have accepted Christ, our Passover, who was sacrificed for us. Was this helpful to them? Yes, it was helpful to them. He was teaching believers everywhere he went. And we can see this throughout history that the early church was actually keeping both biblical and historically. We can prove that the new believers were keeping these feasts in other areas other than Jerusalem. 
and he taught publicly and from house to house these things. Testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and toward our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. And this is something that the Passover teaches very, very clearly. Uh, faith in Yeshua as our Lamb of God and then how we're to live once we accept the Lamb of God. Verse 22 of Acts 20, And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. So here we're seeing this progression to Jerusalem, and everywhere he goes, he's being warned in each of the cities not necessarily by the Spirit of God working on his mind, but by the Spirit of God working on those in every city. This is a point that I'm going to really drive home because we need to understand this. The Holy Spirit not only works on the mind of the prophet, but also on the mind of those in the church. That's all of us. And so when... I get people, and we get people writing in and telling me, oh, brother, you're really mistaken on this. I will take those ideas, and I do do this. I take those ideas that I'm being told that I'm wrong on this point or that point. I take it back to God's word, and I measure it in God's word. And you know what? Sometimes I have to change my mind. But if I can't substantiate it on God's word, I am not going to listen to those people that are trying to straighten me out on these things. And we always have to go back to the word and let that be the final word on what we accept as truth. And I say again, just as in the Garden of Eden, Eve should have went back to God's word, what he explicitly said, and obey that instead of listening to the devil and being all twisted on what the idea of truth was, uh, because God's word needs to be exactly what God said needs to be our final, our final word on what we're going to accept as truth. So he was told uh, by the Holy Spirit in every city, and here again, I believe these are believers in every city, warning Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Going on in verse 24, but none of these things moved me. In other words, I'm going. The question is, how did Paul know, how would Paul know whether the believers were actually speaking with the Holy Spirit, inspiring them, telling him not to go to Jerusalem? It would be difficult for Paul to really get that just as we do when we're told by someone else something, we have to determine whether it's the Holy Spirit speaking to us through them. And so we've got to really use discernment and pray for discernment uh, and figure out what the Holy Spirit is actually saying to us. So, but none of these things move me. Paul never changed his direction. Nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from Yeshua, the Messiah, to testify the gospel of God's grace. So Paul said in his mind, he says, I don't care what people are going to do to me. I am going to preach the gospel everywhere. And if there's a place that I want to go and preach the gospel, it's Jerusalem. That is where the headquarters of the church is. That is where the Jerusalem church, the Sanhedrin, all those people he used to mix with, they're all going to be there. And I am willing to die. I don't care. And he put that thought above what possibly that God was trying to do here by warning him of what was coming for him in Jerusalem. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. He was, he was satisfied with the idea that he'd never see these people again. Why? Because he was probably going to be put to death. 
because this is what he was being told by many. Now it came to pass, Acts 21, verses 1 to 5, when he gets to, uh, when he's getting close to Jerusalem. Now it came to pass that when we had departed from there, we set sail, running a straight course, we came to Kos, and the following day to Rhodes, and there, uh, and from there we went to Patera. Patera. So he's getting closer. Finding, ship, uh, finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had sighted Cyprus, verse 3 of chapter 21 of Acts, when we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed in, at Tyre, for, the sh for there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. So they're there a while. Definitely, you know, if you're going to stay with believers for seven days, you probably will get into some theology or some other things that are, are important. So finding the disciples, we stayed there seven days and told Paul through who? We don't want to miss this. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. Now, we don't know exactly what was said there, but Luke records that through the Spirit. So how does Luke know this, that it was through the Spirit? Was it providence? Did they look back when he was writing all this down later on? Did he look back and put two and two together and see that, you know what? The believers were trying to warn Paul of what was coming. And now I see what came, because this is a historical event of these things that happened. He deduces in his mind that it was the Spirit of God leading at leading the members of the church, and they were trying to warn Paul not to go to Jerusalem. I don't know. I'm speculating to a degree. But it seems to make sense with me that they weren't saying, Paul, I've been told through the Spirit of God that you should not go to Jerusalem. I could see an argument developing there uh, because Paul thought he was being moved by the Spirit to sacrifice himself on the altar, so to speak, in Jerusalem, the place where his Lord was sacrificed. Paul was wanting to do something like what Yeshua did, but my question is, was it the Spirit of God leading him to do this? In his zealousness for dying for Yeshua, did he go past where God was actually requiring him I would say by the record set down by Luke in Acts says that the Spirit was trying to turn Paul from what he wanted to do. And I know there's going to be people that argue with that, and that's just fine. This story is very, very important to us today. Why? Because this is not only history. This is a lesson that if we don't learn here, we will repeat this lesson and uh, it will not go good for us and it will create a lot of chaos. And we're going to look at what I'm talking about there in a moment. Acts 20, 21, 1 to 5 goes on and verse 5 says, And we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went our way, and they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. So they prayed for Paul and they didn't want him to go. And uh, he didn't seem to listen because he was still going forward to Jerusalem. So Luke says the Spirit was trying to warn him. Paul says... And Luke says this earlier, that in every city, Paul was hearing that it's not a good idea to go to Jerusalem. And this is one of, the, one of those cities that it was recorded in. Now he goes from there 
On its way to Jerusalem, on the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea, north, quite a bit north, and on the coast of, of Israel there, Caesarea. And they entered the house of Philip the Evangelist. Now, this is Philip the Evangelist that I believe that um, was involved, directly involved in the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. And this is the same that was, it seems, through the narrative of Acts chapter 8, that he was airlifted to a city uh, a long distance away. I believe that God is going to do that for his believers uh, in the time of the end. I am really looking forward to these exciting times that God is going to ha uh, have for his believers. Healing the sick, and I'm not talking about feeding them with vitamins and minerals. I'm talking about flat out healing the sick speaking in other tongues, uh, doing great works for him. Yeshua said, greater works will you do. And this is what God has for his church in the time of the end. And I certainly want to be a part of that. Uh, but I will fit in the crack that God puts me and do whatever he asks. So it goes on to here, they're at Philip's, the evangelists, uh, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Now, this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. So, this is an interesting place for Paul. So, it's like God is upping the ante here. Paul, I'm trying to get your attention. Don't go to Jerusalem. Now, he ends up at the evangelist's house. And he's, he's got four virgin daughters that prophesy. Well, if I can't get good counsel here, where can I get it? Goes on to say, and as we stayed... How many days? Many days. I'm sure they got into some good discussion here as well. And a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Okay, so get the picture here. We've got the evangelist. We've got the daughters that prophesy. And as if we, Paul didn't get the point there, God sends a prophet, another prophet, down from Judea headquarters, named Agabus, and he came down. So, what do we see here? When he had come down to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says who? The Holy Spirit. Very interesting. Now the prophet declares that the Holy Spirit is involved here. And so that's how I confirm that the Holy Spirit was in possession of the believers earlier when Luke said, by the Spirit, they said this. Because Luke records now that it was through the Spirit because the events foretold came to pass. And that's how Luke wrote with confidence earlier that it was the Spirit because he was recording this after the fact. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him to the hands of the Gentiles. That's a prophecy. And it happened. And Luke saw that and recorded it as such. Now we're in Acts chapter 21. We're moving on to verse 12 now. Now when we heard these things, we, both we and those from that place pleaded with him, with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. I say that the prophet, the evangelist, if the four daughters were there, they pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. It was the Spirit of God through those people that were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. And I know there's going to be people out there that are going to say, oh, that's not what was going on. You know what? Sometimes you just have to stand up and say what the word actually says. And that's what we're doing here. We're looking at the bigger picture. We're saying why, what, where, when. And we're coming to, I believe, some solid rock conclusions on what is going on here. So, what happens? Then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? I want to go and die, uh, for I am ready not to be bound, but also to die at 
Jerusalem. Why did he want to dry out Jerusalem? He was following the example of Yeshua. When he went to Jerusalem to die, Paul was willing to do that. Sometimes in our zealousness to do what is right, we go too far. We go past where the Spirit of God is leading us. This is a lesson that we need to learn. When all the voices around us that are believers, those that want to do the right thing, when all those voices are saying, hey, you really need to look at this carefully. I don't think you're going the right direction. We need to listen for the Spirit of God in the voices of others that are around us and not be so ready to doubt them that the Spirit is working through them to maybe correct something that we're doing. This is Paul, one of the greatest New Testament prophets, and I would say one of the greatest prophets that ever lived, was being corrected, if you will, or redirected, if you will, by the church itself. This is a lesson that we have to learn. Verse 14 goes on to tell us, And when he would not be persuaded, he was consumed in his own idea of what he should do. We ceased. We stopped. What's the point? And they prayed and said, The will of the Lord be done. That's, the fun, that's all we can pray, is that if you can't convince somebody of what we believe you should do or they should do, all we can pray at that point is may the will of the Lord be done. In this case, may the Spirit of God get a hold of Paul before it's too late. That's really what they were saying here, really what they would have believed is may God's will be done in this matter. Because they were confronting Paul, and Paul was confronting them. Neither one really were certain, 100%, of who was saying what through the Spirit of God. And this is, this is what we face today. Sometimes we're not quite sure, but we need to listen. We need to reason among ourselves. We need to work together. If we're ever to have unity, we've got to sit down with each other and reason things out according to God's word and follow the providence that he is leading. In this case, Philip the Evangelist, possibly even four daughters. We don't know if they lived there, but they were virgin daughters. Good chance they were still living there. And uh, also, if that wasn't enough, a prophet came down from Judea. And he knew what was waiting in Judea if they could get a hold of Paul. And he was warning them uh, that Paul was not looked upon favorably in Jerusalem. Verse 17 of chapter 21. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And on the following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders were present. So this is the group of elders that was probably part of Acts 15. Some of them may have been gone, but we know James for sure. And all the elders, so the leaders of the then uh, believing church, they all met together. And Paul was there. Uh, Luke would have been there. All those people that came with them to Jerusalem would be there. I rather suspect Peter was there as well. Because remember, they were hurrying, if possible, to be at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. So we know that all the believers from other lands would be uh, trying to get there if they wanted to keep the feast with the, the church in Jerusalem. And here again, I will stress that they could have kept it wherever they were, and others would have kept it wherever they were, because uh, Paul's example taught that the feast could be kept anywhere. But certainly... You know, if you want to go to the general conference uh, headquarters, uh, a lot of people do that. And they would meet at the general conference here in Jerusalem. There would be unbelieving Jews, believing Jews, um, and there, the numbers would be swelled at this time. 
On the following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders were present. This is where it gets quite interesting. When he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Well, I, I just underlined it in detail because I think that's quite important. Uh, Paul knew that he was going to have to give details on all the Gentiles that were converting to the faith because if he didn't do that, they would doubt whether his work was accomplishing uh, anything. Did it have fruit? So he comes and he's showing the fruit and he's bringing the fruit with him, so to speak, as well. So he's telling them everything that God was doing among the Gentiles. And when we heard it, they glorified the Lord and said to them, You see, brother, how many myriads, I had to work, look up that word, very interesting, a 10,000. What uh, It's a term used as a 10,000. What it is, is lots. It's just uh, a word they use to, to denote, in this case, wasn't exactly 10,000, but it was plenty of Jews there uh, who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. Here's where the trouble starts. We've got a bunch of Jews here that have come to Jerusalem, and they're going to need to know something of what you're teaching uh, people. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they ought not to circumcise their children, nor walk according to the customs. <laughs> I want to put some uh, present day application on this. We'll put some present day um, things on this, events on this. So the rumor was out what Paul was teaching. It was actually not what Paul was teaching in its totality. And this is what we need to understand. This is what we understand. If, um, if we were teaching today that you don't need to keep the law of Moses... That wouldn't exactly be true. But if I was teaching things in the law of Moses that I didn't have to do, then it could be rumored that I'm teaching you don't need to keep the law of Moses. And this is what is going on today. There are many people that say about me, and I'm sure about you, that, oh, you're teaching people that they have to go back to the law of Moses. When in fact, we're not teaching that at all. So then people on the other side, the messianic circles will say oh you're teaching people you don't have to keep the law of Moses why because I'm not teaching people that they're going to have to go to Jerusalem and sacrifice animals a lot of people in the messianic circles are are waiting for a for a temple in Jerusalem so they can so go sacrifice animals and keep the ceremonial part of the law in the sacrificing of animals and all that goes through with that and really, in my mind, they have not accepted the true Lamb of God. And I know all the arguments that they use that show that we need to sacrifice once the temple's in place. But some of those people are even sacrificing a Passover lamb, four-legged animal, at Passover and still claiming to be part of the believing uh, in Yeshua. This is exactly the situation we have in Acts chapter 21. There were those of the Jews that claimed to believe in Yeshua that were still doing those ceremonial things in the law of Moses when Paul was teaching otherwise, and this is where all the confusion comes from. So in my Seventh-day Adventist believing camp, they teach that only a few things in the, in the law of Moses, like the clean and unclean meats, but you certainly don't need to keep the feasts, which I claim, no, they are separate from the ceremonial law, the sacrificial system. God's times don't change. It's just what you do during those times that changed because Yeshua is now our Passover lamb. Therefore, I don't need a four-legged animal anymore. 
So my Adventist brethren need to move forward in their walk and discover new light, new truth for our day, which God is trying to show his people. But my Messianic believing friends and brothers and sisters on this side are saying that I'm teaching certain aspects of the law that I don't need to keep, i.e. the ceremonial things, the sacrificial things. And they say, well, I don't sacrifice a Passover lamb, a four-legged beast. I know some that do in the Messianic circles. Um, According to the law of Moses, that's how they do it. And I know some say, well, no, I don't sacrifice animals anymore. But what they do is they go to the store and they will buy lamb and they will eat lamb at Passover. (laughs) But I would suggest to, to them, and I have suggested, That animal had to die. In other words, that animal had to be sacrificed so you could eat lamb at Passover. So I don't see much difference of whether they sacrifice the animal themselves or whether they have the store to sacrifice it or those that bring it to the store. In fact, I would say the ones that sacrifice the animal are probably in better shape because they've probably bled that animal according to the law, whereas if you buy it at the store, it's probably not bled according to the requirement of God. So let's, we've got lots to think about in that regard. But for myself, I don't sacrifice the Passover lamb, nor would I eat a, uh, a Passover a lamb that has been sacrificed and taken to a store and purchased there. Um, probably for two reasons. I'm a vegetarian, which some may think that's fine and some may think that it's not. But the reason why I wouldn't, even if I was a meat eater, I don't think I'd eat lamb anyways on Passover. I'd probably choose something else just so it wouldn't look like a lamb had to be sacrificed for me to eat the Passover meal. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep or observe the feast. That's what Paul said. I'm going to take his word over anyone. So we need to keep the feast. But as Christ, as our Passover, in the Old Testament, in the law of Moses, how many Passover lambs were they allowed to sacrifice? Somebody tell me. Somebody here tell me. How many Passover lambs were they allowed to sacrifice at Passover? One. One. One only. And if your family wasn't large enough, or there was only one person, you went and shared with somebody that you could share with if there was too much for one family. But here again, it's only one. So if you're sacrificing a four-legged animal here as your Passover, or you're going to the store to buy Passover or buy a lamb and counting that as your Passover meal, and you accept Yeshua as well, how many Passover lambs do you have? You have two. That sounds like a divided mind to me. You can't make up whether you're in your mind whether Christ is your Passover or whether your four-legged animal is your Passover. Friends, we've got to sort these things out because we're coming to a time when Messianic believers are being led, all of them, to the slaughter. And they're going to be going to Jerusalem. They may not believe that now, but this is the teaching out there, that they're going to be led to go to Jerusalem to sacrifice their four-legged animal. This, in my mind, is the rejection of Yeshua as our Passover. This is very serious. This is a very serious thing. Verse 22, let's continue on now. What then? The assembly must meet. So there's this discussion. Does he keep the law? What does he teach about this? The assembly must meet, for they will hear that you have come. In other words, When they all hear Paul's come, they're going to want to know what he's teaching. Therefore, do what the Holy Spirit tells you. Is that what it says? 
The reason why I say that is because before this time, Luke recorded that the Holy Spirit said this. How did he say it? He said it through the people. So Luke records that the Holy Spirit spoke through the people, spoke through Agabus, spoke through Philip the evangelist, possibly the virgin daughters, the prophets, uh, the church at Ephesus, those who were Ephesus, um, when he met with those that came from Ephesus, they were telling him not to go. Luke, Luke records through the Spirit. This does not say, Luke does not say that the Spirit tells you to do this. He records differently. And he says that the leaders, the elders, I don't know if this was James or not. I rather suspect James would have been fully engaged in this. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and purify and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that they all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. Now, I want to ask you out there in the audience, when was the last time you shaved your head and took this vow? Anybody out there? Remember the discussion is over, what are you teaching, Paul? We're going to do this as a test so that you can prove that you're, in, you're teaching we, that you need to keep the entire law of Moses. In fact, we've got four men here that are going to take this vow, and I suspect because this is within the church, this is within the body of believers, they have taken this vow, and I not only want, we not only want you to go with them, but we want you to pay their expenses so that you can really demonstrate that you need to do this. It's kind of going the extra mile. That you're not only just going along with this, you are endorsing this because you are paying for it. That all may know that those things which they, have, they were informed concerning you are nothing. It's all false but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. Wow. So this is going to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt because we've picked this thing and it's something that I know you're not teaching the Gentiles, but because we're Jews, we have to keep these things still. But then they confirm Acts 15 for them. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing, except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. This seems to be in keeping with Acts 15 and the general conference of Acts 15, but was it? I would suggest it's in direct contradiction to what they laid down there, but as we've seen the progression, the Jews kind of went back on what they spoke about in Acts 15, and they went back to the old habits of doing the things that they had, been, that they had grown up to, to doing. But he, they confirmed, oh, but we're not saying anything about the Gentiles. They can do just these things. So they kind of tricked Paul, if you will, into doing something that he would never have ordinarily done. And I believe the reason was, is Paul had some pure motives in doing. Number one, he wanted to reach those Jews, the believing Jews. He wanted to be in good standing with them, which should be, a, a light should be going on. He wants to be in good standing with his brethren, those that are believing Jews just the same way we want to be in good standing with them, even though we disagree. And he also wants to win those that are not believers in this, the Jews themselves. So he conforms to their wishes. And somebody will say, I know because I've spoken. 
with them. Somebody will say, no, no, Paul should have done this. That's what he was supposed to do. And he's confirming that the law of Moses was to be kept because Paul would never do something that was incorrect or out of sync with what the Spirit was leading him to do. Well, we've seen some evidence that would suggest that Paul may have been going a direction that God did not want him to go. And now the plot kind of thickens because he gets deeper and deeper into his predicament here. Verse 26, chapter 21 of Acts. Then Paul took the men and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each of them. Now, this doesn't say what's going on here, but it seems to parallel Numbers chapter 6, the Nazarite vow here. Um, may have been something similar, but it looks like we can get a little bit of information out of Numbers chapter 6. And they had to offer, they had to, in this case, they had to offer turtle doves. Uh, there was a, a lamb that had to be offered at the end as well. So Paul now is preparing to make that offering. And some people will say, well, you see, Paul was confirming. He was in Jerusalem and he was, gonna, he was doing this and then he was going to make an offering. And they say, well, that justifies me in the future when the temple is built, because that's all we're waiting for is the temple to be built. And I would suggest the temple will be built. Those messianics that are reading this are saying, Paul confirmed that, and we're going to have to go to Jerusalem and offer our offerings, whether that be at Passover, whether it be at Pentecost, whether it be at Tabernacles. And they will do those sacrifices as prescribed in the law of Moses because Paul is confirming that they need to do this, that we should be looking forward to this. But I would suggest they could not be further from the truth. Paul was compromising in what he knew to be truth to win those that were on the wrong track. Now, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him. Let's get the time context here. We're at the end of the days of purification, when the offering should be made. He had not made the offering yet. So what happened? The whole crowd laid hands on him. I would suggest that Paul never made the offering never made the blood sacrifice, because in God's mind, in the mind of God, he could not allow Paul to make the offering because then justification would be made that Paul went and made the offering and then, for whatever reason, confusion followed. I would propose that the reason why this happened now is because God could not allow Paul to go through with the sacrificial offering. Paul never made the offering in keeping with what Paul actually was teaching the Gentiles, that they didn't have to do these things. And Paul never made that sacrifice in with keeping. And God saw fit that this would happen. He knew ahead of time what was going on. So did Paul uh, make the offering? No, Paul did not make the offering. Definitely, he did not make the offering. Why? Because he was not supposed to do that. I'm going to read now from Acts of the Apostles. We're going to finish up here. The reason why I do this is because this is another case, as we've seen before, that Ellen White sheds some light on what was going on here. And we want to look at what she says. I find it very interesting. The brethren hoped that Paul, by following the course suggested, might give a decisive contradiction to the false reports concerning him. They assured him that the decision of the former council concerning the Gentiles that's Acts 15 she's referring to, 
Gentile converts and the ceremonial law still had good. So she's differentiating here from the ceremonial law, even though scripture doesn't call it a ceremonial law, there were aspects of the law, and I'll take the Ten Commandments as the obvious one. There, were, there was the law of commandments, the Ten Commandments, with all the statutes that pointed forward to ways you could break the Ten Commandments were actually to guard the Ten Commandments. If you kept the statutes that pointed through the commandments, then you wouldn't be breaking them, i.e. idols and so on. Uh, don't eat uh, blood, which would point you to how you should eat animals. And all these things, the things that they were told that they should do, the Gentile converts, pointed forward or pointed back to certain of the statutes. So the Ten Commandments told them how to live. I believe that Paul was teaching them that they needed to keep the Ten Commandments. How do I know that? I think the very fact that the Gentiles were meeting on the Sabbath with Paul would give a good indication that he wasn't keeping Sunday keeping. He was teaching uh, commandment keeping. And we can look at different things and we can see clearly that he was still talking about keeping uh, the parts of the law that still need to be kept. But the ceremonial law, as called here, would refer to the sacrificial system. And uh, that's, of course, what Ellen White believed. Is that biblical? Well, we need to prove that from the Bible to, to understand if what she's saying here is actually true. And we cannot use her word as the final word. We have to go back to the word of God to get the final word. But in this case, as in the case of Acts chapter 20, verse 6, she gives a little bit of light, and so she confirms um, some things that we were thinking about what the Bible said, which is great. It's always nice to have somebody uh, that agrees with you. But the advice now was given was not consistent with that decision. So she says here that Paul was moving in a direction that was not actually consistent the, of Acts 15, and what Paul believed in his own mind to be true. She goes on to say that the Spirit of God did not prompt this instruction, but it was the fruit of cowardice. Wow, this is amazing. This is really quite a statement. But is it in keeping with God's word? Now let's measure it. We saw all along, I brought out the point, that it says through the Spirit, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem over and over and over again. Now, he ends up going to Jerusalem and he hears something from the apostles and elders that he needs to do this certain thing. But she says it wasn't the Spirit of God. And I brought out the point that Luke even records that it was men that were telling him to do this, not the Spirit of God, as he had done previously. I think she's agreeing with, with the word of God here. The leaders of the church in Jerusalem knew that by nonconformity to the ceremonial law, and she's referring to the sacrificial system now, and even the, the uh, Nazarite vow, Christians would bring upon themselves the hatred of the Jews expose themselves to persecution. The Sanhedrin was doing its utmost to hinder the progress of the gospel. So you've got unbelievers that are uh, just throwing all kinds of grief on the believing church in Jerusalem because some of the believing church was saying, you don't need to do this and this and this and this. And they were creating all kinds of rumors that uh, the same thing they did to, to, to Stephen, actually. They were saying the same thing. He would destroy the customs. That's what Stephen was saying. And that he would destroy this temple and all the rest of what Peter was telling them, it was the same story. Nothing had changed. They were still saying, and now Peter, very interesting, you know what goes around, comes around. Now Paul is addressed by the Sanhedrin, which he was a part of. He's addressed by the Sanhedrin that he is now doing away with the customs of Moses and speaking against this place. Exactly the same thing. So he gets what Stephen got, and Paul was 
in influence, direct influence on the stoning of Stephen. Now what has gone around has come aground. Paul now is under persecution, but he's compromising to win his brother because they were doing their utmost to change Paul's way of doing things. Men were chosen by this body to follow up the apostles, especially Paul, and on every possible way to oppose his work. Friends, I'm not looking for sympathy here at all, but I know some of the things I teach are not in keeping with the traditional understanding of certain churches, and I have teachers in those churches, either teachers in good standing of, of the church or those that have kind of broken away from the church. And I am now carrying some of this same brunt. Does that mean I'm like Paul? No, it doesn't mean it. But I, I have said before, if you are teaching truth, you will be persecuted. That's what we are told. It doesn't mean that you're teaching truth, but you will be persecuted. And sometimes it comes from within than without. Sometimes I think we have more to fear from within than we have from without. Should the believers in Christ, goes on to say, be condemned before the Sanhedrin as breakers of the law, they would suffer swift and severe punishment as apostates from the Jewish faith. So the believers in Jerusalem, James and the apostles, were compromising all along the way with the Jews so that they would not be persecuted as breakers of the law. Paul comes in now to Jerusalem because the rumor was out on Jerusalem and they're going to want to know what Paul's teaching. They convinced him to do what they were doing, playing the hypocrite, and do these things that were against what the church was supposed to be teaching. And Paul did it because he had a burden to be in harmony with his brethren. We've got to learn that principle. We don't need to compromise what we believe if it means to be in harmony with our brethren. We cannot compromise in any way, shape, or form if we're going to uh, do what God wants us to do. Many of the Jews who had accepted the gospel still cherished a regard for the ceremonial law or the sacrificial system or all those things uh, that I believe we don't need to do. That doesn't mean that we don't need to keep the feasts and, and so on. All those, you know, the Levitical laws on what we should eat, what we shouldn't eat. All those things are still good. But the sacrificial system, because Yeshua is our sacrifice, he was a fulfillment of those things. Instead of him fulfilling all the aspects of the festival calendar, he didn't do that. He fulfilled certain aspects of the festival calendar. And those are the things that we don't do, i.e. the Passover lamb and so on. So it goes on to say many of the Jews who had accepted the gospel still cherished a regard for the ceremonial law and were too willing to make unwise concessions, hoping thus to gain the confidence of their countrymen to remove the prejudice and to win them to the faith in Christ as the world's redeemer. So what they were doing is compromising so that they would be able to mix with them, and then sooner or later they'd actually be able to tell them the truth about these things and win them to the truth. Friends, it never works that way. You've got to do what you know to be right and let the results fall with God. Let him work out the results. We've got to do the right thing all the time and leave the results with God and let him work on the minds of those people that will not have chosen I should say, not to believe. And that's painful, as Paul began to realize. Paul realized that so long as many of the leading members of the church of Jerusalem should continue to cherish prejudice against him, they would work constantly to counteract his influence. He felt that if, by any reasonable concession he could win them to the truth. He would remove a great obstacle to the success of the gospel in other places. But he was not authorized of God to concede as much 
as they asked. Wow. That's quite a statement. Now, earlier on, we saw confusion between the brethren. We saw Paul, a prophet, in conflict with Peter, a prophet, and they worked it out. We saw that. Then we saw the prophet in Peter go the other direction and now go against Paul and try and convince Paul to come back to what they believed, played the hypocrite and so on. And so then we see Peter, or then we see Paul address Peter, calling him a hypocrite, doing things that he shouldn't be doing uh, because he's making concessions. And we see the same thing play out with Paul now. What Paul was doing was the same thing that Peter was doing. Very interesting that Paul called Peter on, but now Paul was doing the same thing by compromising and doing those things that he shouldn't be doing. And here we have someone in the person of Ellen White saying that, Paul, you were not authorized by God to concede as much. Now, if we put two and two together, we can see the whole trip to, to Jerusalem was by God through his church. Paul was, or God was trying to get Paul to stop going where you're going. The outcome is not going to be good. And here we have, I believe, Ellen White confirming what Luke recorded. It was not the Spirit of God that was calling Paul to do what he did. And all she's doing is confirming what the words of Luke say that God did not authorize Paul to do this. But we think of Paul's great desire to be in harmony with his brethren, his tenderness towards the weak in the faith, his reverence for the apostles who had been with Christ and for James, the brother of the Lord, and his purpose to become all things to all men so far as he could without sacrificing principle. When we think of all of this, it is less surprising that he was constrained to deviate from the firm, decided course that he had hitherto followed. And I would ask that God had led him in the past. He deviated from how God had led him in the past to be conformed to the brethren. This is always wrong. But instead of accomplishing his desire, his human reasoning, instead of accomplishing what he thought he should do and to bring about certain objectives, his efforts for conciliation only precipitated the crisis, hastened his predicted sufferings and resulted in separating him from his brethren, depriving them depriving the church of one of the strongest pillars and bringing sorrow to the Christian hearts in every land in which he traveled. This is an amazing count, account of what happened there in Jerusalem. And in my mind, she is in perfect harmony. Now, if she wasn't, I would disregard this. But I see this as in perfect harmony, and it not only is in perfect harmony, she elaborates on some of the things that are going on and help me to really come to a fuller understanding of what the word in Luke's brevity is actually saying. She goes on in page 411, 412. The apostle was now to be tried by the same tribunal of which he himself had been a member before his confusion. This is just absolutely amazing. So he condemns Peter way back then. He finds himself in the same position as Peter, being on the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin. Now the Sanhedrin is going to judge him. Um, boy, if he wasn't learning the lessons of the past, God was bringing him around. The apostle now, now is to be tried by the same tribunal in which he himself had been a member before his conversion. As he stood before the Jewish rulers... His bearing was calm, and his countenance, the peace of Yeshua. Later, while reflecting on the trying experience of the day, so he's reflecting on what all happened back then, 
Paul began to fear that his course might not have been pleasing to God. Wow. So he's reflecting on everything that has happened in the past. He's probably reflecting on, you know, Philip said don't go. The, possibly the four virgins said don't go. Agabus said don't go. The church, wherever he went, said don't go. He's now being caused to reflect. He began to fear that his course might not have been pleasing to God. Could it be? Could it possibly be that he had made a mistake after all in visiting Jerusalem? Had his great desire to be in union with his brethren led to this disastrous result? The position which the Jews as God's professed people occupied before the unbelieving world caused the apostle intense anguish of spirit. How would those heathen officers, those Roman soldiers, how would they look upon them, his brethren, claiming to be worshipers of Jehovah and assuming the sacred office? All the confusion of the day, and you go back and read it in Acts 21, it was a, it was a disaster what happened that day. We have screaming, yelling by people that are apparently believers and worshiping in Jehovah. It must have been a mockery um, seen by those Roman soldiers and those in leadership of the Gentiles. And it threw um, just a whole lot of rubble on what they were supposed to be doing. Yet giving themselves up to the control of blind, unreasonable anger, seeking to destroy even their brethren who dared to differ with them in religious faith. Friends, when we jump up and down and scream at those that differ from us, this is the wrong thing to do. And turning their most solemn, deliberative counsel into a scene of strife and wild confusion, Paul felt that the name of God had suffered reproach in the eyes of the brethren. When we are around people that don't understand things, maybe the same way we do, maybe they're, they're young in the faith, they're just coming to a knowledge of what is truth, and somebody starts jumping up and down and telling them, oh, you don't have to believe that, that's all heresy and all this kind of stuff, we are going to be held responsible for this. We need to be very careful what we say to others. It may be, that one day God will require us to cough a confession up that maybe we were the ones that were in error and not someone else. Yet giving themselves up to the control of blind, unreasonable anger, seeking to destroy even their brethren who dared to differ with them in religious faith and turning their most solemn, deliberative counsel into a scene of strife and wild confusion, Paul felt that the name of, God, of his God had suffered reproach in the eyes of the heathen, those that knew very little. So I want to leave, um, leave us there right now. We're getting a bit of a feel to where I'm going, I think. We are learning some lessons of the past with the leaders, even the prophets, uh, the prophet's word, the prophets are subject to the prophets. We've got a verse for that. So if anyone claims to be a prophet or a teacher of God's word, how do we test that? Is it their word alone? Well, the example of Peter is that Peter may endorse something, but if it's not in line with those of the prophets, um, then we would discard it. But as we go through the New Testament, we can see that they are in harmony uh, with the prophets. Were they perfect? No, they weren't perfect. Did they believe things in some cases that were maybe incorrect? Yes, they did. Did they always operate out of uh, perfect principle? No, they did not. And we need to learn this because if we're going to have prophets in the future, we're going to have to know and understand how that all works so that we will be able to work through these things. And here we have someone, Ellen White, who has wrote much on, uh, of, of things that parallel the Bible. And in, in the cases that we've looked at, 
uh, she seems to illuminate some of the things uh, that are in the Word that are a little bit uh, not full of understanding and, and fully revealed. And so we can use her as we have here to bring fuller light. And we're going to get into this a little deeper next time because we need to understand this, I would say to the nth degree, if we're going to be among those that are glorified at the end. So let's have a word of prayer, and then if we want to open it up for any discussion, we can do that. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word that is sure, and we ask that you continue to lead us and guide us into all truth and show us things to come. And Father, help us to remain humble that we will listen and uh, reason with our brethren to know what is truth. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen.